I'm going to talk today about innovation in pharmaceutical product development. And uh, I'm going to give you a little bit of an overview of where we are at Shire, and then we'll explain our uh, different platforms and our approach. So uh, innovation is at the heart of our strategy, where you know our purpose is to enable people with life-altering conditions to live better lives. And our aspiration is to innovate in order to develop meaningful uh, solutions to unmet medical needs. So our pillars, our strategic drivers of, uh, of Shire are growth, innovation, efficiency, and people. And in pharmaceutical development, you know, we, we fit, we have goals underneath each one of these pillars. Uh, for example, advancing late stage pipeline assets, uh, supporting the launch of new products, uh, extending the existing portfolio to new indications and therapeutic areas. Um, efficiency is always very important. Uh, operating as a lean and agile uh, uh, workforce and of course developing our people. So our, our res disease uh, model uh, expands an innovative portfolio, and at the center, of course, we have an integrated R&D organization that is focused on rare diseases. Uh, we have several therapeutic areas, and you can see that you know the cross um, the rare and non-rare diseases, but most of our products fall in the rare disease category. This is just a snapshot of our pipeline uh, products in development. We have a number uh, of products in discovery research late phases of research, getting ready to uh, progress into development. Uh, the therapeutic areas include hereditary angioedema, uh, renal transplant, ophthalmology, GI hepatology, CNS, and also we're looking at uh, possibly some products in the um, hematology oncology area. So there's specific challenges with um, dealing in the rare disease space, uh, including uh, very little understanding of the disease. Uh, there's no precedent for clinical study uh, design and also for clinical endpoints. Um, very, very hard to find, very few and very hard to find patients, so our clinical trials are very small. And there's also um, extremely high medical need, which translates to a lot of pressure uh, for early access, but also translates to a lot of pressure to us in pharmaceutical development to uh, develop things quickly and get them to clinical trials and then to market. So um, that was the very general uh, introduction. And so, you know, our, our therapeutic platform landscape is what's really very relevant to, to uh, my talk. So while we are focusing on identifying the best modality uh, to affect biology and then uh, the quickest way to get the proof of concept of proof of mechanism in, cl in the clinic, we are very ag agnostic in terms of therapeutic platform. And you can see that we have uh, products discovery and, and research and development candidates uh, um, in all five of the buckets um, I'm presenting here. Gene therapy is one where we are looking at uh, therapeutic delivery of cDNA for gene correction or gene editing, um, exon skipping, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we have an mRNA um, replacement therapy uh, platform. For short, it's called MRT. Uh, we have uh, products that are proteins. We have uh, monoclonal antibodies in our pipeline and also a very large number of small molecules. So because we're not obviously experts internally in all of these different modalities and therapeutic platforms, we collaborate very broadly with external innovators, universities, startups, and some of them are shown at the bottom. Um, Sangamo, Ethris, Argenex, um, Nimbus, et cetera. So the Shire's model is not to expand our internal um, capacity capability. So in other words, we want to work in gene therapy, we want to work in MRT, we're not hiring 100 people, uh, obviously, to, to execute on this in research and in development. Uh, so that's, that's the general philosophy. Um, so in order to be successful in innovating in R&D, 
you know, we have to innovate across the entire value chain uh, from discovery research where innovation starts, but it doesn't end there. Uh, we have product process development, late phase launch, commercial supply chain, and life cycle management. Um, just some highlights uh, in pharmaceutical development or PD or process development, different companies call it different things. Uh, we work with uh, discovery research very early on, uh, especially with um, products that we think potential candidates that we think have a high probability of success um, in lead optimization. And um, by the time something transitions to development, uh, we have a pretty good idea of what the product is like. And and I just want to point out that when we collaborate with discovery research, we really focus mostly on the analytics and some pre-formulation work. We do not work trying to develop a process um, when the product is moving um, into, um, into the development. We start process development when um, the can development candidate is chosen. So we typically have you know, the usual pharmaceutical process development, uh, clinical manufacturing, clinical trials, um, late phase launch. Um, if we've missed the window to do a lot of process characterization, a lot of process development, um, this is another window of opportunity where we can actually um, develop a more pro uh, process uh, robustness and increase our product understanding. And there's a lot of work that's done in um, after the product uh, gets launched in the market uh, because of the pressure in the timelines. We typically have a number of uh, post-marketing commitments and the continuous improvement is not limited to just yield increases, tightening specifications. There's actually significant work that needs to be done um, in, in uh, when we're dealing with products in, in rare disease. And then life cycle management, of course, we're looking at either uh, going all the way back into discovery research and developing the second generation candidate, or we're looking at things like improvements, uh, new formulations, um, new delivery methods, et cetera. So, I'm going to talk a bit about all the different platforms and the approaches that we take uh, depending on the platform. Um, but basically, especially with the new platforms, uh, we are really trying to leverage both internal and external network of, of uh, collaborators, innovators, subject matter experts. Uh, they can be CMOs, uh, CROs, or our internal manufacturing. Um, our general approach is to try to develop a generic um, toolbox that we can just use and then apply to each molecule in the particular platform to gain a knowledge around um, that molecule uh, during the development. Um, life cycle, and then you know, develop a unique solution, uh, which is usually required with our products to enable both clinical and commercial success. Now, depending on the um, modality, we take a different approach based on uh, risk, um, the perceived risk or calculated risk, uh, pre-proof of concept of proof of mechanism, the maturity of the platform, internal capability and capacity, and external capability and capacity. So we don't have a complex algorithm for this, right? We just use common sense and some pretty basic calculations. Um, a, a, a simple business case. Does it make sense to do it internally? Does it make sense to do it externally, for example? Um, so it, I, I put the, the platforms that we're working on on, in, in four different buckets for simplicity's sake, and it's based on the criteria that I just mentioned. So gene therapy and mRNA replacement therapy are new platforms, they're evolving, our understanding of those platforms is evolving. The capacity and capability, both internal and external, is pretty low. So uh, versus something like monoclonal antibodies, these are small molecules, which are not the topic, small molecules we're not gonna talk about today, but they are more, much better understood and much better, um, much easier to find uh, uh, external partners to, to develop and manufacture. So for gene therapy, 
uh, you know, like I said, we have a lot, and NMRT as well, we have multiple evolving production platforms. Uh, we have evolving process and analytical technologies. So what we have decided to do, with the exception of MRT, so mRNA replacement therapy, where we do some of the development internally, is outsource everything. Uh, but we are leveraged because we, of course, have to oversee the contract development or manufacturing organizations. We leverage our expertise in biologics and bioengineering, bioprocess, to manage uh, those CDMOs. And of course, we have um, brought in people uh, that have experience in vaccines or gene therapy from previous companies, et cetera. For proteins, which are, are stable, we are, are, um, uh, Shire has core expertise in, um, we do something very different. Um, there we can kind of pick and choose whether we are going to develop and manufacture internally or we're going to develop and manufacture externally or uh, a mix of both. So that depends totally on um, the, the complexity of the protein that we're working on and also the capability and capacity of um, a, a external manufacturer. Uh, in terms of novel formulations, which our products typically require, we can do some of the work internally or externally. And again, some of this work is done even with university. If it's something extremely novel, we go back to uh, university labs. Uh, with monoclonal antibodies, like we do with small molecules, we are planning to outsource end-to-end. Uh, -to -end. And I won't belabor that. Um, and then device and combination products is another thing where we have uh, core experience in um, uh, the device and combination product department, and we have hired uh, several people, like a core group of, of people that have expertise in device, but we're not a device manufacturer. We're outsourcing everything, but again, we uh, oversee people, and the combination product part is something, our understanding of that is evolving like it is evolving with everyone else. So, I want to go through some of the select opportunities for innovation in biologics, but I want to say first that, you know, that regardless of the platform, the novelty of the platform, if it's an old platform, we still have the same drivers, and the approaches are somewhat similar, right? So if we're looking at innovation as a driver, the most important thing is to define the new plot platform technologies. What are we going to what platform are we going to use? We need to establish that up front. Um, or at, at, at some point before we hit phase three. Um, we also want to establish innovation partners for platforms that we're not planning to develop internally. Efficiency, uh, we absolutely need to streamline technology platforms. And I, I'll give you an example later with gene therapy. Um, smart make or buy decisions are very important. We have to do this, these early. We can decide early on to buy, but then once we have proof of concept and there's less risk in an investment, we should be able to bring something uh, back into our internal manufacturing if we want to. And then in terms of ensuring that we have a stable supply chain, uh, you know, building process capability and then building quality and compliance into our product and process is something that, of course, we do all the time time. Um, so in terms now of, of product development, I mean product development value chain opportunities, um, if we look at raw materials, cell culture, purification, analytics, and dry product, um, I, I, I'll try to point out some areas where I think either we need um, innovation or we're focusing a lot of, um, you know, a, a, a lot of thinking and work, or areas that I think are challenges, and this is very um, highly selective uh, list. Um, so in terms of raw materials, with new products, with new platforms especially, gene therapy, MRT, we're introducing a lot of new raw materials um, that are not traditionally necessarily used in the industry. 
And so we need to understand the variability and we need to understand um, whether we can actually control the variability of the raw material or if we need to implement process controls to control the, the inherent, we, we just give up, we can't control the variability, let's say of media or something. So we're gonna uh, develop our cell culture process so that the cell culture process will control the variability. Standards for single use, we use single use components everywhere. So having standards, understanding change control, and what changes at the uh, manufacturer uh, impact things like leachable and ex extractables. Another thing I think it would be uh, a great innovation is to create databases, both vendor and user innovation um, databases that we can all share in terms of uh, you know, giving us more information about different types of raw materials. Um, for cell culture, we of course have to uh, you know, innovate around platforms uh, for new entities. And um, volumetric productivity is something that is going to be a challenge for us with all of these new platforms, um, gene therapy, the productivities are really low. And by the way, you know, the productivity of our cell culture uh, protein um, uh, platforms are also always kind of a challenge. They're not monoclonal antibodies where you see five grams per liter type titers. The connection to downstream processing um, is, is, a, um, is a challenge. And then also, again, control variability. And you'll see that the, the controlling the var variability and the need for um, adaptive real-time control uh, will show up throughout. So purification, um, again, having platforms that we can use uh, for all these new entities easy and available to us um, would be great. Affinity, uh, fast and affordable. Affinity chromatography, for those of you that work with antibodies, you know, we don't have affinity uh, options for all these proteins, so that's a challenge for us. Um, high throughput, high, th uh, high productivity, high selectivity, excuse me, um, membranes or, or um, presence. And then things like single use into dis, in, uh, process into intensification and adaptive real-time control for process control. Um, analytics is an area where you know, we, we have made a lot of progress uh, for proteins in developing uh, platform approaches. It's very hard when you have different molecules every time uh, to develop a platform the way we think about a platform for a monoclonal antibodies. But we do, we have developed platform approaches. Um, high throughput and high resolution, and also the ability to analyze uh, crude samples rapidly uh, for things like clone selection or cell culture optimization. And then um, the, the, we still have not made a huge amount of progress in uh, uh, a process analytical technologies in process, even in, in other uh, bioprocesses. So I see that as an area of opportunity. Um, for drug product, uh, we are investing in a lot of uh, novel formulations and novel delivery methods. Um, so there's a lot of opportunity there, combination products. And I, I, I put this last thing, intrinsic particles. Um, and, and I think this is a huge area that has really we struggled with with our proteins. I know people have struggled a lot with antibodies, understanding the kinetics and the reasons, the root causes of formation of, of intrinsic particles, uh, you know, protein aggregation, what's causing it, visible, subvisible, how important are they, is it a problem? So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm thinking that we're going to have to try to understand very quickly uh, the, 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 the concerns the same concerns are going to come up with, with viral particles and mRNA, et cetera. So um, a lot of uh, innovation, I think, or in, in innovative solutions will be um, needed in this area. 
And of course, knowledge management is huge. Um, and I'm not gonna talk about, uh, about knowledge management because of time constraints, but having a platform approach for acquiring um, data and then converting it into um, information and knowledge is huge. And for us, it's a huge challenge as we're outsourcing everything um, and integrating all this external data and information and turning it into knowledge that we can actually use um, for filings, et cetera. It's, it's a big challenge. Uh, so let me give you a few fun examples um, of innovation in, uh, um, in, pharma, in biopharmaceutical development at Shire. So one example is, and, and, and you know, try to think that I'm, I, what I'm thinking is applying some of these um, cool approaches that we took, uh, innovative approaches to a new, completely new platform, right? So we were working with a, a unique human cell line at Shire, HT1080. And the reason why we picked this cell line many moons ago is because these cells, which are human fibroblasts, they produce authentic human glycoproteins. And um, initially, they were in royal bottles, then we adapted them to, to suspension, and they don't grow very well in batch or fed batch, so it's a perfusion process. And so, you know, unlike CHO cells, where everybody else in the industry is working on CHO cells, and there's a huge amount of information being published, and people are talking about it, and people understand how to tweak CHO cells to uh, grow better, to make more, et cetera, et cetera. We were on our own, so, you know, we, we used transcriptional profiling uh, for process development uh, to increase the productivity and improve the product quality to basically understand how HD. 1080 cells work, one makes them tick. Um, another uh, example of innovation was, again, driven from a compelling business need, uh, was uh, the introduction of a, um, a single-use uh, bioreactor and continuous uh, centrifugation. So what we needed at that time was more capacity and speed to market. We needed to, to get the capacity up and running and, and uh, filed for approval. So, you know, the, the, our basic platform was the mammalian perfusion platform. So what we didn't know was how much more capacity we needed and uh, what size, what volume. So it was, the solution was to build a fully disposable um, cell culture uh, and purification suite um, in an expandable shell so that you could just duplicate that. Um, very fast, very quick, um, again, we had to work uh, very closely with um, Accelerex that made the um, um, single-use bioreactors and also uh, with CAR, the manufacturer of the uh, continuous centrifuge, to make kind of on the fly almost modifications. And we continue to work to make continuous improvements on these two um, technologies in order to, uh, to adapt them to our needs. Um, another example here in purification now is, um, so like I said, we have all these different proteins in our pipeline. They're all different from each other, and purifying them is not easy, right? So it's actually, it actually takes uh, a lot of work to figure out how to purify a protein X versus protein Y, and it, it takes time, too. And a lot of times you don't, you, know, you don't know what you don't know, so you find out even after four or five purification steps, you've got too much DNA, too much, uh, whole cell protein, whatever. So we were working and we're looking at a number of different platforms for affinity. And, you know, again, this is an example of working with an innovator, an external innovator. Um, uh, so we, we, we used Capture Select and they had developed this great platform, um, uh, Camelid IgG um, affinity platform. And, and the problem was, you know, that, that it was taking too long. Okay, it was very expensive too. But also the worst thing was that it was just taking too long. So we worked uh, together, collaborated to try to figure out how to put all these um, work pieces together so that it could actually fit into our phase one clinical development timeline so that we could use it so it wouldn't be too late, right? So I think that's, um, um, that's a, a good example of working together with external innovators. Um, 
uh, I have a couple of analytical examples. The first analytical example is using um, high throughput LCM SMS for uh, glycopeptide mapping uh, for clone selection. And we want to use um, these, these more high, highly, highly selective or high resolution techniques early on, but we're stumped by low throughput. So this methodology where you're using, taking semi-purified clone samples, digesting them with two um, enzymes and putting them on an LCM SMS, and then using a semi-automated data analysis system, um, this, uh, which allows a comparison of very large uh, numbers of, of files, LCMS MS files, um, allows us to early on look at post-translational modification, um, not just identifying, but also quantitating them and compare them. And so it helps us select clones, very, or the right clone, very early on. Um, and proteomic analysis of uh, HCP from um, uh, the perfusion bioreactor. So again, knowing very early on what, if we have a contaminating protein that co-purifies with our um, protein of interest, we know what it is, then we can target purification. So again, using a number of innovative techniques out there, um, which you know, we put through the LCMS, MS again, and um, able to identify very quickly uh, the, uh, the culprit and then target its removal. In preformulation and formulation development, uh, the big problem here is that uh, you know, we can't, th that work cannot happen very early because of lack of material. So using uh, design of experiments to, allows us to use every last drop of, of product and then using techniques, for example, um, instead of using DSC, using a differential scanning fluorimetry, um, that can be miniaturized, allows us to do it, no, uh, analyze samples not only quickly, but also very efficiently. And so we can apply this to new platforms. Again, combining um, virus biochemistry with virus biology and engineering to build robust uh, properties. We don't throw all that we've learned in bioprocessing out the window. So what we hope to do is go from the current state, which we're at right now, where we are using multiple different platforms that our partnerships with universities or startups are bringing in and we cannot change because we would delay phase one, proof of concept, proof of mechanism. But the, the, the scalability of these platforms is, is very questionable and so we're also learning about what the critical quality attributes are and also how to control variability. So we're at this stage now. And you can see on the bottom, uh, we have uh, situations where we're looking at adherent culture or cultures that are in um, suspension, but regardless, they use transient transfections. Um, purification involves uh, density gradients to separate the empty capsids from the full capsids because there's no other better methodology to you know, some future state where we have um, stable cell lines in a bioreactor and more standard chromatography UFDF uh, type of uh, equipment or uh, process steps. And the same thing for analytics. I know that you're I'm running out of time, so I'll go pretty quickly because I really want to go through this neat um, kind of life cycle management. Um, it's, it's only three slides. So I, I think this is really a, a neat thing that Shire did, which is we, were, we have a product on the market, Elaprase, which is a donate to sulfatase, uh, an enzyme replacement therapy for, heart to, uh, for Hunter. But uh, in severe cases of Hunter syndrome, there's uh, also CNS involvement. And you're watching your child completely you know, lose uh, all their cognitive function. So the 
the IV drug, the Eloprase drug, which is given IV, of course, does not cross the blood-brain barrier. So there is no treatment for um, Hunter CNS uh, on, at all. It doesn't exist. So the first step in innovation at Shire was to take a intrathecal device, which is shown up here, and implanted, now this is obviously not a child, this is a rhesus monkey, but um, implanted and put a port here and all the way delivered directly the drug into the brain. And it actually crosses, um, I mean crosses, it gets taken up by the, uh, the, the CNS and it goes into the lysosome and it's active and you can see in this PET scan, you can see the, um, that the, the elaprase has gotten into the brain. So the second uh, iteration of this was a collaboration that we have with uh, Armagen, uh, which is in California, and Armagen has developed a platform uh, for delivery specifically to the brain. So it's a Trojan horse uh, fusion protein that um, you know, combines um, a monoclonal antibody against the um, insulin receptor. And here's iduronate 2 sulfatase, our enzyme, and you have a IgG fusion. And it's using basically the endogenous insulin receptor transporter to uh, cross the blood-brain barrier. Um, so you can see here, two hours after injection, the um, fusion protein lit up the brain. So it looks like it did cross uh, the blood-brain barrier and after IV infusion, um, and it did get into um, uh, the lysosome. So we went from Eloprase, uh, which could not go into the, um, uh, into the CNS, to using a device to get to the CNS to uh, this very neat um, approach, uh, hope, which we all hope obviously will work. And for us in process development, it's, it's not a huge, as huge amount of effort as you might think, because you know we're in, from going from Eloprase to um, I2SIT, the intrathecal version, we changed the. The, um, the formulation, of course, because we're delivering to the CNS, and um, we developed the whole combination product aspect of it, and, but we're leveraging all the process and the methods already. Um, and the same thing with um, the, uh, the fusion protein, we're leveraging all the methods associated with the actual enzyme. So that's also helpful. And of course, we have to develop a new formulation. So in conclusion, um, we, regardless of the, the platform, uh, we always apply engineering principles and quality by design principles, uh, starting with product understanding uh, when the product is in uh, discovery research still, and then continuing to build product and process understanding through the development life cycle. I think it's very important to decide internal versus external development and or manufacturing uh, upfront. Um, and you know, make uh, both strategic outsourcing but also strategic insourcing decisions to balance speed, flexibility, and cost. Uh, regardless of what you do, you still need very broad and deep technical expertise. Um, outsourcing doesn't mean that you, you're free, you're home free. You still have to do a, a huge amount of work. And then um, finally, uh, even though I didn't talk very much about it, knowledge management strategy is a must have, especially when you're outsourcing uh, to many different um, uh, organizations. Thank you very much.